Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Homeschool Together. I know, this is weird. I'm doing the intro, but it doesn't mean Matt's not here. It's just that I'm the one kind of interviewing him today on our episode about writing. Today, we're going to be talking all about writing fiction. So this is going to be a really fun discussion. And since Matt is our uh, writer in residence, we're going to depend on him to help us out. This is something that I know you've been studying for a long time. So I'm really interested to get into this with you. Before we start, if you have not gone out there and looked at iTunes and left us a review, we'd really appreciate that. If you haven't joined our Facebook group yet, come join that group great group of people. Mm -hmm. If you haven't checked out our YouTube, we're doing some fun things and we're going to be continuing to do some cool things on YouTube. So please go over and check us out. And I think this writing month has been really fun. We've had that great interview from Jeannie and we've talked about how to encourage writing. So today we're going to be talking all about fiction because I think fiction is one of those things our, our kids have to, I remember in school writing mostly nonfiction and hating it. And my Mm -hmm. The only writing exercises I remember really enjoying were writing fiction. There was a couple of stories. In fact, we found the bound storybook from when I was like a freshman. The, it was called Impressions, <laughs> the freshman literary magazine in which I have a poem about eagles. I have no idea why. And I have a Revolutionary War story that so, I wrote. It was all patriotic stuff. Well, no, the eagle one wasn't. It was because our mascot was the eagles. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> but we found this the other day, and I'm like, I remember that story. Yeah. I wrote a couple of different historical fiction stories when I was in school. Um, I wrote one about that. I wrote one about the fall of the Bastille. And those are a couple of things like I, I remember the most. In, it was the only time I ever remember actually enjoying writing. So I think this is fun because, you know, we, t- yeah. we think about our kids writing having to, you know, write critical thinking essays. And, exactly. you know, I remember writing a lot of like lab reports and all that kind of stuff. And this is the fun part of writing. So I'm really interested to get into this topic with yeah. you. You know, one of the things when we always hear about, you know, somebody who wants to write, we don't think about them writing, being a journalist or, you know, writing nonfiction or whatnot. We always think, oh, they're going to write a story or some right. type of yeah. fictional tale of, you know, whatever. It could be a fantasy, sci-fi, right. you know, Not that nonfiction can't be fun, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. it, it can be, and, and I did a lot of journalism too, and that, yeah. you know, journalism can be fun and that can be cool. Um, but you're right. There's something like just fun about having their imagination and coming up with these characters and telling a story. So you've been writing for, how many years now have you been writing for? Um, almost eight years. Okay. So you've been writing for eight years and in, in self-publishing. Mm-hmm. Um Unfortunately, they're horror novels, so that's <laughs> not, not exactly my jam. Um, but I, uh, I do all of your major story editing, like like you, like you do um, my reading, yeah, yeah. I do your your reading for like major arcing, like plot lines and character yep. motivations yep. and things. You do all your line by line editing, mm-hmm. so um, it's been kind of a fun collaboration. So I think this is really. Fun. I want to hear about your process to get into writing fiction because I usually see it. I hear about this early idea when you're like, "Hun, I have this great idea," and it's always some horror story thing. I'm like, "Ugh, can we just write a romance for me?" Anyway, so I have one. I I yeah. yeah what's, what's, you've been teasing it for nine years. I, I'm 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 like gonna write like some Gone with the Wind type of like sweeping epic. It'd be. What was it? What's the working title? It's a joke. It's through time and toil. <laughs> through a working, time. That's a working title. <laughs> through time and toil. <laughs> that's, uh, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. We've So I usually hear at the beginning when you're like, hey, I have this really great idea. And we kind of talk through it. And it's exciting sometimes. It's exciting if it's not a horror novel. And I'm like, yeah, I want to definitely uh, get you to write that. And you, you've yet to produce. Um, and then the horror novels, I'm usually like, oh, that's creepy and icky. And I don't want to talk about it. 
Um, and then, you know, you work on it for some amount of time and I don't get to see it through the process. I get to see it at the very end yep. Yep. when I'm reading to say like, well, that doesn't sound like that character <laughs> would run away from that monster in that way, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> as you as you tear my heart out after I've, I've been working right. for six months on this thing. Right. And, well, and, and there's times when I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Why would somebody do this? <laughs> Although I have to say. It your, made sense in the moment. <laughs> your, your, your grossest twist ending was actually my idea. That's right. So. Ah, maybe I'm there. Um, so I'm excited today to talk about the process of fiction writing. So more than just an idea before you have something completed, all mm. of the thought that goes into it, and how can we, um, how can we teach our kids from the the new and emerging writers to mm-hmm. the ones that are getting older? You know, your your older upper elementary, junior high, and then into high school as they start wanting to develop more complex stories. And I know you've done a lot of research about you know, how to structure stories and how to write fiction. So I think this is great. So just to set the groundwork, how should we approach writing fiction with our kids? You know, going in off of what Jeannie had said in her interview, which I think is very illuminating, and I'll keep coming back to it, is that storytelling and writing, the act of writing starts even before they can write their letters, right? The the whole act of telling stories and reading stories and talking to your children and asking questions. I think absolutely sets the groundwork so i don't want anyone here to say oh i got a six-year-old they're not ready to write stories or anything like that we know now that you know that four-year-old is ready to tell stories that six-year-old is ready to tell stories just as much as that 12-year-old or that 14 or 15 year old it may just be more sophisticated Mm -hmm. but they are all ready to tell stories along the way and so the key there is to be fun and i think we we try to approach that with every aspect of homeschooling, right? That's kind of a de facto caveat that we always want to say, just keep it fun. But I think what's more important is that teaching writing fiction, writing fiction is such an elusive goal of being good and great and successful. There will be people who write for their entire life and they never publish anything, right? Mm -hmm. They're constantly coming up with manuscripts, never able to make it. And then you have someone who's like Stephen King or whatever, pumps out great book after great book after great book. And it's just so elusive. It's such an, an incredible thing. So the idea of teaching fiction writing, I think, is a, a misnomer. What we want to do is we want to enable our young writers to write fiction and figure out the process of writing good fiction because there is no one way to do it. And what's funny is we'll talk a lot about it, a number of different tools that you can expose to to your young writers to help them become better writers, but all of them are right and they are all wrong depending on who you're applying it to, you know, whatever, you know, that your child is learning, you know, whatever their method is, how do they like to write? There are so many different types of writers out there. There's garden writers who just write by the seat, they would call them pantsers. They write by the seat of their pants. They don't do any (laughs) plotting. And then there's other people who are called plotters and they will you know, plot to the ends of the earth. Like a great example of that is Robert Jordan. Robert Jordan. He he died and yet and and yet yet, Brandon Sanderson could finish his Wheel of Time series because he had done all the the plotted the entire thing out. And and I and I've heard that those plots of those books are legendary. They're like three or four hundred pages long. Just the plot. Just the plot, right? And then you have someone who's like, you know, George R. R. Martin, who kind of is more of a pantser and he struggles to, you know, keep his story together and whatnot. So there are different types of writers and different ways of approaching fiction writing can apply to different writers. And I think that's really, really important to understand is that you want to enable your writers and not teach them fiction. There's always different ways to do it. This is, you know, the way you want to do it is just to enable them. Another thing too is, especially with the young writers, and I'm not even just talking about the, you know, the young kids, I'm talking about like the older students as well. This is not a place for critique. Critique is in the classroom, you know, in their in their writing class when their teacher is going to be, you know, doing line editing or or critiquing, you know, their story flow or whatnot. When we are teaching or allowing our children to write fiction as sort of a homeschool activity, as something that's learning that we're we're teaching them how to write or or they're enable they're engaging in that writing process. Fiction is so subjective. Every single person listening to this has read a book. And the person right next to you didn't like that book and you did. And it's so subjective and it's really, really difficult to understand what is good and what is not good because it is so subjective. So one of my things is to remove the critique element out of the writing process and allow them to just have fun. Okay. And that 
the improvement, that incremental improvement that they get from writing every single thing dies, you know, in the light of, you know, excited, you know, ideas and, oh, you should change this or you should do this or this isn't right. This is not that correct. Oh, the character would never have done that. And I think that motivation, that excitement can die in the, in the young writer um, when they're feeling like their work is being criticized. Writers are very, especially fiction writers, are very self-conscious. A lot of mm -hmm. them are very introverted. It's very rarely do we have an extroverted writer. <laughs> Most of fiction writers tend to be very introverted. And they're very, I mean, almost protective over their work. And it's very sensitive to them when they mm -hmm. are critiqued. Um, only some people can handle critique really well. I think I handle critique fairly well. I think you do. What What do you think, you know, on that is... is the, the way to do that. Certainly we don't want to stifle our young writers, right? We yeah. want them to feel uh, free to express themselves, get yeah. their ideas out there without us criticizing them. But we do want to help them grow. And yeah. certainly we've read more than they have read. Exactly. So um, at, at what point is this, is this a maturity aspect, right? You know, maybe, you know, your elementary writers you don't worry about, but your junior high or maybe not even that, maybe your high school writers, are you looking at that and, um, are you helping them? I'm thinking maybe you're coming from a place more of curiosity. Yeah. So why did your character do this? Exactly. What? Oh, why would this happen here? You know, and maybe if we come from a place of being curious, I know that's a, a common way to give critique um, to folks who are sensitive about it. Exactly. Is that maintain that curiosity. Do you, do you think that that's the way that you can start to build someone who can take the feedback? Exactly. I, I, I think that... The that's a good point. But also, I think the one thing that the reason why I take, I think I take critique a little bit better is that I detach myself, like the, the writing from the, the, a lot of, a lot of times people will see their writing as an extension of them, because a lot of writers will insert themselves into the story. It's famous all, all throughout most writing is that there's a piece of the author in the story because it came from them. And when you critique that, they, they actually feel like they're, you're critiquing them as a person. And so a lot of times I like to separate my work f from me, even though I do, I do that myself. I put, you know, not people I know, but like experiences I've had, or, you know, I, you know, the ideas that are in my head, the meaning of the story, the meaning mm -hmm. of the character's arc or whatever it might be. I put that in there. But I try to maybe, maybe the thing is what we need to do is to tell the person that your story is your story and it is now in the world, you know, whether it's just mommy's reading it or daddy's reading it. Um, and they're free to interpret that. And, and, and I, and I, and I really firmly believe that like once it's in a, a written down, it is no longer mine in, the, in that respect. Um, but that takes, I think, maturity to get to that point. Like, I think when I first wrote my first book and I gave it to you, I was like, She's going to hate it. It's going to be terrible. And I'm never going to write another thing ever. Right. Right. And right. I, think I didn't hate it, but it totally grossed me it out. It did. Yeah. Um, <sighs> but I was able to, I think over time, separate that. So that, I think that, that's a maturity of writing things. Once you, you know, once you write that first thing, oh my God, this is the most important thing ever. This is the mm -hmm. first time I've produced something that has a lot of meaning and weight. But then once you've written your 20th thing, you have this long line of, of work that is out there. You become a little bit more detached from mm -hmm. the piece. And I think that's a maturity thing, but I'm, I, I agree with you approaching, especially with early writers, any more sensitive way, more questioning or bringing allusions to characters. Like if you notice there's like that character, why did not all of a sudden they did this right. weird thing, right? You can try to like pull in allusions to like a TV show or a movie that they enjoy. Oh, do you remember when this character did this thing? Would that be of something that your character would have done? Oh, I don't know. You know. Yeah, I think coming from that place of genuine curiosity, yeah, without, I think a better way to without it. critique is is a really great way to to help folks. You know, to help kids. So I think that's a that's a good way to get them started. So we've kind of covered, you know, how to approach this and yep. how all writing is a bit different. But let's talk a little bit about structure of story because yep. this is one of those things that separates the you know second grader meandering through their story yeah, exactly. <laughs> where you know it doesn't make sense to um you know that that junior high or high school writer who wants to 
you know, make a, a better, more cohesive story that hits kind of the beats that are expected. And, and one of the great ways to do that is to teach them about story structure so that they can, they can kind of know before you even have to come in and be curious, oh, this, you know, this kind of makes sense. And they can see stories are not exactly like math equations, but yeah. there's a little bit there that's there's patterns and things. So how, how would you go about teaching a, a student about plotting and story structure? So I think with younger learners, you want to avoid the whole idea of story, story structure because it can get very confusing. Like, what right. do you mean? It's too much. What, I'm building it like a building or an architect. Like, I don't understand that. Mm-hmm. I think instead you want to focus on what they identify the most, which is they know people. They know friends. They know characters that they love, right? And so introduce first the idea of character and the character motivations because at the core of story structure is this idea of why does my character make the decisions they're making? What are their motivations? What do they want? Um, from there, there's there's a lot of other ideas and, and, and things, and we'll kind of touch on a little bit of them. But at the base is the idea of the character. And that's what I think most people, when they say, I, I loved a book, nine times out of 10, it wasn't for the plot as much as it was because they identified with the character. And a lot of times you'll see people who are really passionate about certain books. They're like, oh, I love that character. I love that character. That's my favorite book ever because it was that character. I am I tend to be more of a little bit of both. I like more plot and character, but people who are really passionate about books and passionate about writing always talk about, okay, the character matters because I want to hook that reader. I want them to identify or at least empathize with my character and that's telling a story. So I would focus mainly if you've got these young learners, like for example, when we do our writing prompts for our ancient civilizations. I always approach my daughter and I say, okay, here's the writing prompt. You're an ancient Sumer. You're doing this stuff. And here's a, here's what happened. And you found something and I'll tell her, okay, first of all, we, we have the idea of what we need to do, but who's your character? What are they? What's their job? What's their, you know, is this the first dig that they've done? Is this their hundredth? Are they trying to get a promotion in their job? You know, is she a college student? Is she a mommy? Like what is, because my daughter always writes female characters. So I just like assume it's right into the female character. But, um, and I ask her those things. I say, okay, let's get that character in your head and let's go ahead and figure out what does she want? What does she need? And what problems is she going to face? And how is she going to resolve that? And she goes, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, great. So she can wrap her head around this magical character, this, because so many times you'll see your children playing and, and they're, they have like a little doll or they have like a, you know, a, a, an Elsa doll or something in like that, or they're, you know, what do we have? The American girl dolls or whatever mm-hmm. we have. Um, they immediately start talking as if they're the doll, right? So mm-hmm. they immediately put themselves into that character. And I think, especially if you're younger writers, you know, whether they're not writing yet and you're doing the dictate, you're doing the transcription for them, or maybe they're like kind of late elementary and they're able to hand write it. I would really focus on them thinking about the characters first and character motivations. And as the first element of story structure, once they get a little bit older, you can begin to expose them to some other types of ideas. I think the most famous one that we've all heard is the hero's journey. And that was by, um, uh, Joseph Campbell. Um, and he kind of had this idea of the monomyth. Now, the idea of the monomyth, that there's all, one story that kind of encompasses all stories as applied towards culture and history, I think that's been resoundingly debunked in, in, in some respect. But the idea of the hero's journey as a tool for telling story is an incredibly powerful tool to give to a young writer because it gives them their first set of tools to write a compelling story a story that they may have seen on the screen, that they may have read in books before. Um, Classic example, and I'll put a link in the show notes here, is Star Wars. George Lucas used... Yes, please put a link in the show notes. No one will be able to find it without it. (laughs) Exactly. I kid, I kid. (laughs) One of the great things is that George Lucas used um, Joseph Campbell's um, Hero's Journey, and I think um, Christopher uh, Volger, if I'm right, broke up... um, Campbell's journey into like 12 pieces and I'll uh, in the link that I'll give you it actually walks you through the entire story in all 12 pieces Luke's you know you know come you know he has to leave and why does he leave with Ben and his family dies and now he's cast off and now he has to you know find the problems and, and solve solutions and all the various points in that story that helped build the, you know the classic arc another great example of that is Moana 
right? Mm -hmm. She's called to action. She has to go and leave her family and she has to go on this journey. And she has this mythical wizard-like creature, Maui, that helps her through the trials and tribulations. And she has to get to the end and solve the problem and and whatnot and, and find out in a surprising but inevitable conclusion that Taka was Tefiti, right? Oh my, spoiler, spoiler alert. Everybody has seen it. I've seen this movie a million times. Spoiler Spro- alert. I'll, I'll put best in the sh- ending in ever. Best ending. Except when they turned on the Disney, the, the Disney, Disney music. music right at the, right end. At the very end. <laughs> they like left all the islands music that was amazing. As, and it was as like. The, as the island was rising out of the ocean. Well, yeah, as, she, as, she going, was, yeah. Oh, as she laid back down. As Tefiti yeah. laid back down. Then they played like classic Disney music. Somebody let me know if you also noticed this. I was <laughs> kind of miffed. Yeah. Continue. No, absolutely. And another great example of that. Now, obviously, our children aren't watching this, but if you have a little bit of an older uh, child, The Matrix is another classic example. And I, and I think I was reading online that um, the directors of that, actually, the writers were actually against kind of Campbell's storytelling. But like, they ended up doing they, it anyway. But they ended up doing it anyway and made this really popular thing. So. That's a great one to start to introduce. And I'm not saying you do that with an eight-year-old. I'm talking like we're talking about middle school, maybe early high school. Expose them to this as a tool. Now, not every single story follows the hero's journey. Um, They don't have to. But sometimes when you're first introducing someone like, hey, how are you going to play? How are you going to throw a baseball? Okay. The first thing you do is you, you teach them the basic mechanics of throwing with an arm, your shoulder turn, hip turn, arm, elbow, position, throwing overhand, you know, whatever. But eventually they develop their own rhythm and their own motion. And writing is very similar to this. Give them the story, the hero's journey. Trust me, there's not a person who criticizes the hero's journey that wouldn't bend over backwards to have written The Matrix or Moana or Star Wars, right? They would love to have written those stories. But once you begin to be exposed to the writing and how to do these types of things, you're going to learn that it's just a tool and then you can tweak the tool and write your own type of thing. But Hero's Journey, I think, is a great starting point for people to go and start with those kind of middle school, high school, you know, fiction writers. Once they're starting to get more sophisticated in their writing and in their storytelling. Once they get to that middle school range and they're starting to develop a style. So we've mentioned him before, but his name is Brandon Sanderson. He's a very popular, very successful, very, very prolific uh, fantasy writer. We mentioned he finished uh, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series, the epic, I don't know how many, 15, 18 books now or whatever it was. Um, He has a course on YouTube. That's like 12 or 13 episodes long where he gave a lecture series at BYU. And it's incredible. Like from, even if you don't want to write fantasy, he he walks you through his whole process. He walks you through all the thinking that he has. And I think from a standpoint of being a, a young burgeoning fiction writer, seeing a master craftsman give you the full breadth of how he thinks will, I think, inspire young writers to go, okay, there's something bigger than what I'm doing now. And I need to think more grand and he need to elevate myself. And it's a great lecture series. It's wonderful for those, you know, middle school, high school, young writers. I've watched it. It's fantastic. Another one is um, The Story Grid. And this is one that I followed about eight years ago. This one actually helped me get my first book finished. And I'll go ahead and link that. I would not go to the podcast because it's a little meandery. I would go to just stay with the book. And you can check out the book from your library. They're, it's very popular. Um, and there, I'll give you a couple more links in the show notes, but story grid is another good one to give to maybe a a young high school reader. Um, again, a writer to, you know, understand the idea of structure and scenes and how it all links together. Mm -hmm. Character motivations work with plot and the decision-making shows the more sophisticated nature of linking story as you're, as you're building your stories. Right. And that's made by a a prolific uh, editor. Editor. Sean Coyne is his name and he's really, really good. Um, he's really insightful. I loved listening to his podcast, but it, the podcast, I think, lost the thread because it just went on too long. Yeah. And it, it, it's hard to pull like, oh, go to episode 50, you know, 500. Don't or talk whatever. smack about anybody else's podcast. I know. We have We're long... on episode 300 and some, some, some. 339 <laughs> now. <yeah. laughs> but, but there's some things that you learned there about like obligatory scenes and yes. things that I still think when I read books, like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, you'll, I'll finish with something. You'll say, was it good? And I'm like, yeah, except they missed the obligatory scene yeah. where such and such was supposed to happen exactly. and I, so i felt as a reader very unsatisfied so i think what's really great about the story grid 
it, it was fun. You used to story grid movies and things when we would watch yep. them. And then that's an awesome way to teach young writers about, you know, how this works in practice is to actually, you know, be taking notes while you're watching a movie and see how the movements are made. Very often I'll tell you to pause a movie and I'll say, hey, can you pause it? And be like 25% in. Got it. It's like the end of the first act. And right. You're character- starting to like see You've beyond. Seen- because, yeah, it's funny because we'll watch a movie. Like, oh, pause it right now. It'll be like a Marvel movie. Big action sequence at 50% right on cue. Like the- like there's a formula that these people right. you know, follow. And the- yeah. below the movie that you're watching, they structure things in a certain way. And these types of yeah. tools that we're talking about, like Story Grid, kind of pull back the curtain and show you how they create the things we all enjoy, where we just sit back and passively right. like enjoy it seeing how it's structured and how they think and to, to understand what they're talking about in the writing room with respect to crafting story is really insightful for a young writer to know, okay, what type of questions do I need to be asking myself when I'm writing these characters, when I'm writing these plots? And this is not necessarily something for like a high schooler. I mean, I think a middle school or even a late elementary student who's really enjoying the writing fictional process, you'll, you'll hear about these Famous writers, I mean, they were writing all the way back into their elementary years, right. writing stories over and over and over I think again. This is really good if you've got a student who wants to write for the enjoyment of others. Exactly. I think there's you know, it's kind of a couple of different ways. Sometimes you just write for yourself mm-hmm. and you're not, you know, you're not looking for your audience to really enjoy. So you don't need obligatory scenes and, mm-hmm. you know, the structure of it. But this is great for those people who, those students who really want their writing read by others or who are... They envision being a published writer or maybe, something. Yeah, like. maybe they want to... They, this is be perfect for an aspirational you know, writer as a career. Um, one of the things that this is really good for is the student that has a really good idea. Mm-hmm. Hey, I know I want to write a fantasy or a sci-fi. I want to write a sci-fi and I, I, I want to be about this character and I want them to do these couple of things, but I don't know how to put it all together. Mm-hmm. This is great because it kind of gives a formula that they can say like, okay, how can I... Walk you know, myself through this. Walk yeah. through this this piece and understand which pieces to put in where. So it, th- I think it's a really good tool for those who want to like plot out their story because they, they can't just sit down and start writing. Uh, absolutely not. Another um, channel, and I'll link the YouTube channel, is Michael Arndt's channel. Um, he's a screenwriter um, of the fame of Little Miss Sunshine, if everybody remembers that movie. It got it was kind of an indie movie that you know got, I think it was up for Best Picture. Yeah, it was a good movie. Really tremendous, r- really good movie. And it was just... Very heartwarming and everything. Also, he is of Toy Story 2 fame. And if there are the guys listening, we all remember us literally crying twice in that movie. Um, and he is the that reason for that. Rough, man. I mean, th- those two scenes, man, the, on the conveyor belt going mm-hmm. into the furnace. And at the very end where he's the playing with, with the little girl. I was crying at the end. And, and, and he walks you through on his YouTube channel in, I think, almost, this is probably a channel that's meant, more meant for a high schooler. Um, very elevated thinking about how he crafts story and he's done you know obviously toy story 3 i think won the best picture for animated movie sure little miss sunshine you know classic indie film yeah that was up i thought that was, was up, up for, for best, best picture, picture as well yeah. and so um you know he's an expert and it's great to listen to experts talk about their craft because you learn so much and they're and they're just willing to share they don't care because it's hard it's hard work and 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 they're really good at it and they're not afraid that like you know, somebody else is going to yeah. upstage them. They're like, no, this is hard. And here's how I do it. And it's really cool to listen to people talk about it. And his videos are really long. They're almost like hour and a half. They're almost like lectures. They're college lectures. Really good YouTube channel. So I'd recommend that as well. So I think that's a really great discussion of structure, you mm-hmm. know, and you know, how to help craft a story. And, and there's no right answer. There's right. no right answer. That's why you want to like touch everything and right. then, you know, apply what you think works. So we've we we've gone from structure and we we've heard you know there's kind of that old old adage that good readers make good writers Mm -hmm. so let's talk about the component of reading how do you think that reading factors into helping our kids to write good fiction it's no different than like with them learning to walk they watched other people do it they helped people do it and all of a sudden they started doing it talking is the same way learning your manners learning how to act in the world we see things we learn how to do it and then we mimic it and reading is reading and writing is the same thing. Like I don't see any difference between the two. Reading a great book that has been edited by Simon and Schuster editors, and yes, on page thirty-four there was a typo. They missed one. Who cares? This is an accomplished writer who knows exactly what they're doing, who has been edited by seasoned editors 
who know what they're doing have produced you a book for you to read. This is really good. Now, that doesn't mean that doesn't it's... Doesn't mean the story's great. It doesn't mean that there's depth there. Doesn't mean there's depth there, but this is something where you're going to say, I'm going to be able to know how to write good dialogue. I'm going to know how to write good scenes. I'm going to know how to write good compelling, you know, plotting, um, good characters. Reading books across a wide genre, across genres, uh, very wide. I always say very shallow, but wide. That's my, my thing. But if you enjoy a certain genre, read deep, but maybe try to touch other genres as well, you know, here and there. Um, be an expert in what you're, what you're reading. It will help you be a better writer because you will just intuit that. And you talked about this with like the obligatory scenes. As yeah. a romance reader, if I were to write a romance, I don't read romance. I don't watch romance movies. Yeah, if it was missing the meet cute obligatory scene, exactly. I'd be like, "Well, when when did they meet that? Di- oh, wait, it didn't fe- it, it, for you as a, a you know a viewer or a reader. You would say it's missing something, and I don't know what it is. Right, right. Something feels wrong. So I think that the the thing that's important here is there there is even from the big publishing houses lots of crummy crummy work. Of course, so of course, always you know been edited and but you know they they they're in a the business to make money. Yeah. So this is one of those places where I think we can help our kids Mm -hmm. by helping to curate really good books for them. This is a place where curriculums like Build Your Library are really powerful because she has such excellent curated books. Her history book by Booksite is also another great way to go. So um, I know that right now our daughter's listening to a lot of audiobooks and you're carefully curating which audiobooks you're choosing. You're doing a lot of, I love to read reviews on Goodreads. That's Mm -hmm. one of my favorite places aside, you know, Amazon's kind of a own thing and i think that they're starting to list goodreads stuff but goodreads has a lot more depth um in their recommendations so i think if you want to cultivate good writers i'm certainly read 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 but there is a difference between you know really great fiction and i'm not saying that this is high literature i'm just saying really well crafted fiction i remember award-winning books right. and things of that nature and i yeah. remember when you started writing you hadn't read as much fiction as i had and i was like you got to start reading a bunch of fiction and you you had just recently read game of thrones and i said you've got to read the first book of game of thrones just for the craftsmanship mm-hmm. that went into that book because exactly. it teaches so much so the only advice I, I think that i would add to this is just to try to find your kids really good books and mm-hmm. supply them with things that are going to help teach them them good writing and good and compelling stories and not just kind of surface level stuff i agree and also what's also important about reading a lot is to understand what you like because you have always said this write what you enjoy or right. do what you enjoy I, I i sometimes regret that as you only write <laughs> as you only write <laughs> urban fantasy horror yes so <laughs> Yes, yeah, of course. You know, I, I regret it a little bit, but I agree. But, but it's the thing, and a lot of times writers will think, I need to be this type of writer. Like I'm going to write literary fiction because that's what I, I think I need to be. But I really like, you know, paranormal romance, yeah. shifter romance, right? Go for it. Maybe that's what you need to write. Write what you enjoy. Write what you read a lot of, right? Every time I read a literary f- fiction book, I get tired and I don't like it. Okay, but... I like horror books. Well, write horror. Right. And you right? know, and somewhere out there there are there are authors making very good money writing mm-hmm. in those genres that other people would call like trashy. Trashy trashy books that are like, you know, those people who just write dime a dozen sci fi books. These are people that are probably making good money. And a lot of these And they books, enjoy what they do. They love what they do and the books are fun to read. So yeah, when I'm when I'm saying you yeah. don't have to write Moby Dick. Exactly. And when I'm saying help your kids find good books... But I want you to write Moby Dick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when I say help your kids find good books, too, I, I don't mean that they have to be... They can just be fun. But some of these books, especially produced for kids, are just like um, generated by committee, almost. They're, they, they're, they lack that fun. So that's where you have to be kind of careful. Absolutely. So we've talked about reading. So now let's go to the next step, which is writing. How do we encourage our kids and, you know, help them on their journey towards becoming fiction writers? I think the the key thing about writing is, and I think I alluded to this in the previous episode, is it's something you probably want to do often. Now, do you want to do it every single day? 
you know, obviously for our younger reader or younger writers and our younger readers, maybe that might not be right. But if we have a, a young writer who is really enjoying the writing process, wants to write fiction, you know, doing something every single day for a little bit is not any anything outside the norm. You know, whether it's actually writing pencil to paper or typing on a computer, or if maybe they're just planning, or maybe they're doing some character design. They, they're sketching out a character. Or they're printing off an actor that they really enjoy. And they say, oh, my avatar for this character is Brad Pitt, right? And he's going to look and act like that guy. So I'm going to print off a picture of Brad Pitt. I'm going to write all the details about my character. And then I'm going to put him in my sleeve of my, my planning book and I'm going to move on. You know, maybe the next one is plotting or daydreaming or asking what if scenarios. What if I was you know, going along the lake and all of a sudden a giant came out of my lake and thinking about what if scenarios and how I would handle certain things or how characters would handle certain things is in and of itself an act of writing because they are letting their imagination run and think and plan. So, but how do they, how do they capture those ideas and, and keep them fresh? My biggest thing that I would say is a journal, um, a writing journal, um, again, promoting good handwriting. So you can see different aspects of our homeschooling can be wrapped up into this, but planning, putting things on journal, journaling, writing down plots that we enjoy, things of that nature. One thing that I do is I have a Google Drive account where I just capture all of my ideas, whether it is, oh, I got a quick idea because I was listening to a podcast and they're talking about, you know, going out shrimping in the, in the Bering Sea. I'm like, well, what if there was a murder mystery that happened on a boat and blah, blah. <laughs> all of a sudden your mind goes crazy. You go, oh, oh hold on, got to pause. I open it up. I create a new folder, I quickly jot down the idea, I give it a working title, and I, then I, I, I go, okay, great, now it's out of my mind and I'm not gonna forget it. Having a, a way to capture your thoughts and capture those ideas, absolutely important, and I really, really would encourage you to you know, teach your, your young writer, your young reader, on how to capture those ideas in order to store them and so they don't forget about them. That's one of the worst things for me is like, oh, I'm driving down the road, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I have this great idea. And it's like, oh my God, I can't, you know, I got to like, I'll send you like a text message. Hey, this is not for you, but I'm capturing a, you know, a thing <laughs> and I'm dictating something or whatever. I'll, I'll write something to myself and I'll say, okay, here's a, a, a story idea that I just need to capture and I'll just dictate it real quick. Capturing those ideas, I think is the biggest and key, biggest point. And again, I consider that writing, like you thinking it's above ideas, it's part of the process because you're going to say, Oh, that book idea that I had over here, or that story idea, you know, that would be really cool if that was a character in this thing that I'm working on. And I'm very often I will take something from over here and I'll slap it in here and I'll kind of massage it. And all of a sudden now I've added complexity to my story and whatnot. So the ability to, you know, essentially save those ideas is super important. Another thing is having a working notebook to, to write down dialogue or phraseology. I had a writer that I knew who had a little pocket journal in her, in her like purse and anytime she heard something funny or a funny joke or a funny turn of phrase, you'd, I'd watch her. She'd be like, she'd write it down real quick because she goes, oh, you know, it'd be really funny if a character said that in my book, right? Just being observant. So what I'm hearing from that is that, yeah, you're, you're observing it. It could be anywhere your kids go. Like what yeah. if they have a pocket notebook that they could just put down if they went out and something you did on a nature walk, they saw something that interested them and they can yep. jot down words or, or feelings that they had about something or that that's a pretty cool way to, to, to manage emotions and think, you know, if they're kind of experiencing something that they can kind of be jotting that down and maybe they maybe they put it into a story or maybe they just write it down for that moment and it helps them process. Yeah, I've heard it said that a lot of times good writers are really good armchair psychologists where they can get into the head of the character mm -hmm. and understand the psychological motivations of people um, and maybe even learning a little bit of psychology or jotting down what you think about something that happened or, hey, we saw this you know, guy, you know, yelling at somebody in the, in the, in the store or something like, and you, maybe they want to jot that down as like, wow, that, that was kind of wild. How did I feel about that? How did the people around me feel about that? Yeah, That's I can see of, this being kind of a high school level type of thing. Exactly. Obviously it's not for the younger kids, but you know, for the older kids, they can really capture those emotions and capture those feelings. Um, it, I think is a really cool thing. Another thing about writing and, and just in general, when, when you're kind of like approach it every single day is to tell your writer that, Writing is not a, you know, a spontaneous event, right? We always love to hear the stories. One of the famous ones is Jack Kerouac when he wrote On the Road. It, the rumor was, he even said, I wrote it in three weeks, nonstop, on a 
on a typewriter where it, I, I was so writing so fast, I could not afford to take the paper out and put a new piece of paper in. So he wrote it on a, on a scroll. And the whole book is on this giant scroll. And you can see it. And I'll link the article in there. I think it's an NPR article where they talk about it. But in reality, that's a myth. It took him years to write that book. He thought about it. He experienced the events. It's an autobiographical story of his experiences with his friends. And he revised the book multiple times. He may have actually written on that scroll, but how much of that book actually made it into the final print? I don't know, right? So it's not a spontaneous thing. It's not going to be something you're just going to sit down and write your short story. This is a long process. And I think it's important for the, the young writer to know that writing is a process. It's not an outcome. Yeah. It's not like they just, they sit down and, and boom, here's I mean, my novel. Right? Obviously they're obviously when you're talking about short stories exactly, and things yeah. that, yeah, that can be done in a single sitting. But if you're, if you have a, a student who's interested in becoming a writer, mm-hmm. you know, even for fun, um, and writing longer form work. Yeah. It's a, it's a multi session. There's, there's thought, there's planning and mm-hmm. preparation that goes into it. It's easy to do. Writing is easy to do. Anyone can sit down and write some dialogue and write a simple little plot, but it's hard to do well. And I think most important thing is when you're approaching your young writer and they want to write and they've, ex- you know, said, I want to be a writer. I want to write more. I want to write short stories. Um, Understanding that it's no different than another hobby or sport or any other type of skill that we need to learn. We need to approach it in that type of mindset that we need to practice and repeat and try to become better like like it's a sport and then a muscle that we're training or a skill that we're honing, whether it's writing or whether it's reading, it could be challenging and it takes time. So I think that's an important thing to, you know, approach. Okay, so we've talked about the process of reading process of writing that it is steps but you know now what should kids write we've talked about this a little bit before Mm -hmm. we talked with Jeannie like and and we talked about encouraging writing but it is difficult to decide like what's the right thing to write how do we how do we help our do we do we help our learners find the topic that they want to write about is this completely free or can we you know, is it if we put this into an assignment and say, hey, write a short story or write about this topic, does that stifle creativity? So what do you think about uh, about helping them with with what they need to write or want to write? Yeah, it's one of the biggest questions is always comes up like, what do I write? You know, especially in the fiction uh, arenas, like, what do you write? I, I go with Jeannie on this. Let them write what they want to write, right? Let them free write. Let them um, uh, chase whatever ideas or imaginations they, they have. I would not try to regulate their writing to follow a certain type of genre or a certain type of style or anything like that. I would really go with the learner on this one because especially when they're younger, the writing is a very difficult task and you want to make that as easy as possible to help encourage more of it. So maybe do you leave it more open-ended? Yeah. Say, you know, hey, we are studying... Uh, World War II right now. Yeah, yeah. So I want to task you with writing something about World War II, and and if they're like, well, that's a huge topic. Like, what? Maybe you know, maybe it's it's helping them. What do you find most interesting about this topic? What are you curious about? Because part of writing is research as well. Exactly. Even with fiction writing, is research of what would be realistic in this case. Yeah. One of your books is set, you know, back in time a bit, and so you have to research. Well, what technology did they have access to at that time? What would have been realistic? Mm-hmm. So maybe one of the things is to be curious with our learners about you know, what about this topic that we're studying are you interested in that we could then, you know, you could then build a story off of. Exactly. I think it's gauging what to, what your writer wants to do. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying, okay, my writer's writing a bunch of stuff over here, um, fan fiction or a short story or graphic novel or whatever it is. And it's not against the rules for you to say, okay, as part of our curriculum in ancient civilizations, I need you to write me a writing prompt about ancient Sumer. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. But it's one thing, that it's, it's another thing to say all of this other stuff that you're excited about, don't, you're not writing that. You're only writing writing prompts over here, right? Yeah, right. If they're yeah. really excited about something, it's Absolutely. like, don't stifle that. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're, you've got a, a fourth and, grader who wants yeah. to write only unicorn stories, then go with it. Exactly. And, and if they're so resistant in doing your ancient Sumer thing, you can sit there and say, okay, same writing prompt, but they're writing a unicorn, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and let them bring the thing in that they want or go in the other direction. Here's a writing prompt for ancient Sumer. But you love to write 
do graphic novels because you like to draw and you want to do that, can you do it as a graphic novel? Right. Absolutely. Go ahead and run with it. Right. So try to meet them where they are so that you can pull them. I think we all understand this, you know, as homeschoolers, we always want to meet our, our learner where they are. Right. As a lot of us who are eclectic and always have that unschooling understanding of learner led education. I think in this arena, especially with fiction, because it is so intimately personal to the individual writing it, try to meet them as much as possible. We talked about this earlier, how how sensitive some writers are because they put so much of themselves into. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times when you're writing a story, it's in your head. And then when you put it on the paper, that's still in your head, right? And it's like, here it is on the paper. It's in my head. I have this intense connection to this thing. And I'm very passionate about it. And it might not be the best thing ever, but it's a piece of me. Yeah. And so we have to be more respectful. I don't think there's anything that I can think of, I mean, outside of like sports and accomplishments and things like that, where you're going to get this apex of the activity that I am doing is a reflection directly upon me. Well, I think that yeah. that's art, right? It is. It's, and and it's writing, is a, process, yeah. writing is a form of art. So I, th- I think that that's exactly why that comes out. Um, but one of the things that you always talk about is starting small with your learners. Uh, Absolutely. So starting small, I think is the key to anything. I know when we say, Hey, I want to write. If you have a writer who's like, I'm going to write a novel, man, that is such a big thing to to break off. And next week we're going to talk about writing challenges and using writing challenges to, to move, to move the ball forward on what you're trying to accomplish. But I always say, start small and even start even smaller than that, like not a short story because a short story has a complete arc. Start with a scene. What happens if Dave falls off the cliff and gets stuck? What happens if the, the fire starts in the kitchen, right? Just throwing out these scene prompts. And I have a, a link um, that I'll put in the show notes about like a hundred scene prompts that you can provide to your, to your young writer. Just what if scenarios, like catastrophizing something, an earthquake happens, you know, what would Timmy do in the house? You know, would he run away or whatever? Um, uh, aliens come down and 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 zap away our dog. Mm-hmm. How are we going to get him back? You know, right? Like little things like that are just like these great what if scenarios because it gets the the creative juices flowing. There's a lot of funny uh, uh, tools online where they'll give you the first line of your story because the first line is always the hardest. Well, you can do a fun one too with your yeah. iPhone, oh, yeah. like you know, just click whatever the middle button is, you know, <laughs> to let it like autofill. Autofill. That yeah. could be fun, or you know, use ChatGPT to yep. you know come up with you know, something, something crazy that that could always be kind of humorous. Exactly. I think it might be kind of cool too, to maybe you write along with your learner. Oh, that's great. Right. right. You, we talk about modeling reading, but what about modeling writing? Mm -hmm. What if we say like, okay, today we're going to both write short stories and we're going to write them about what, and that could be really fun for you to pick the topic for your learner and Mm -hmm. for your learner to pick the topic for you. Ooh, that's a good one. And you have to write the short story. And so, I think that's nice because we talked about the vulnerability of sharing yourself, of sharing your art. So you have to be vulnerable too, which could be really fun. I know one of the... reading back your writing in a dramatic performance. I mean, you could do anything with it. And the other thing about writing, which we haven't talked about in writing fiction, is you could write a screenplay. Oh, yeah. Right? So, or or a theatrical, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, play, a script of some sort. That's another fun way to do it. You could write a script and then your family could do some acting. Mm -hmm. Our daughters had a really good time making up plays and things. So there could be something fun about making this art something communal. Exactly. I'm um, also taking fan fiction. I think it's another big thing because a lot of times our young learners, you know, they're so flighty in their interests, but when those interests are there, they burn hot, right? Like oh, I am so into this right now. Our daughter is into Pete the cat, right? She's deep into Pete the cat. There's no reason why she should not be able to write some fan fiction of Pete the cat meets our daughter, right? <laughs> you know, whatever it might be. Right. I have an right. example here of like, what if Galadriel took the ring from Roto? Like what would happen, mm-hmm. right? Write some fan fiction of, you know, would she become the terrible queen that she thought she would, right? right. And, you know, th- those great, you know, having them write in things that they're interested in um, and then having them do what if scenarios allows them to be creative within the realm of a lore and world building that they don't have to do. Some of the hardest stuff for writers is to create the world, all the rules, all the all the places and all the people and all the conflicts a lot of times if we have a fan fiction, that's already been done for us. Right. Right. And so all we can, all we have to do is go, I already know what Scooby-Doo would do in this scenario. You know, I'm going to write some fan fiction about 
you know, what Shaggy would do in this thing. Well, and whatever, that's exactly right? what like we're doing. Like our daughters are really into Scooby-Doo right now. Right. right? Our yeah. daughter is actually writing fan fiction this week because we finished mm-hmm. um, we finished reading a book series and the, the, the it doesn't have an ending. Yep. And so we said, well, great. We'll just end it with some fan fiction. When what a fun way, you know, if you've got a kid mm-hmm. who's really into Artemis Fowl or whatever the book series is to say, gosh, I wonder what it, what it would have been like if Ron and Hermione didn't go to Hogwarts, but they went to Beau Baton <laughs> instead. What would have happen to them right yeah. or you know i mean a million different things what if what if harry actually got picked by slytherin you know right what slytherin if he became house? a slytherin yeah that, that could be, amazing, be right? really interesting to read about yeah. or i mean think of it think of anything and this is this is really it's really fun and and those kind of things are fun too to start audibly mm-hmm. doing that storytelling you could audibly start talking about fan fiction and this is a really neat point, too, because it's critical thinking for our kids to think through, okay, I know this character. I mm-hmm. I know Galadriel from Lord of the Rings. This is what I know about her character. And now I'm going to do this other thing with her. How would she react? What does mm-hmm. that look like? And you're using a lot of these thinking skills. Mm-hmm. I remember that uh, Audible Stories is, I mean, Audible Stories is the first way you tell stories to your kids, even before exactly. you read. Yep. Um, and one of the things we love to do was telling stories from movies. Mm-hmm. We went camping one time uh, with our daughter. It was just like two summers ago. And she she wanted us to tell stories around the campfire. We're and right, we, We're not very good at that. Well, we're, yeah, we're just not good at coming up with something totally off the cuff. And we were so exhausted from a whole day of like camping and hiking and all this stuff. Yeah. We were like, well, once there was a man named Named the terminator (laughs) you know (laughs) wasn't the one like there was a man named james cameron and he wrote this movie called the abyss (laughs) right we started telling the whole story of the abyss and she was like she was just intrigued and we go and then there was the terminator (laughs) and we we just went into the the soundtrack (laughs) yeah (laughs) right yeah so we told her all of these uh, stories of of some of our like favorite movies and she was enraptured by storytelling my dad did the same thing to me he told me like on the way to school he'd tell me the story about alien or indiana jones and i was too young to watch those movies but right because they would have been too scary these are amazing stories dad you're amazing you should write these down right i mean so it's kind of fun so i think that's a great way to do it if you aren't good at coming up with stuff off the cuff and you can have your kids do that to you too tell me the story well, what of... if story yeah. tell me this like we talked about this earlier tell me the story of your day tell me the story of your um stuffed animal you know right. origin story right and i think that's the very start of fiction writing exactly. is you know telling other stories and then telling your own story even verbally before you're writing it down and thinking oh, yeah. about dialogue and you know all of that just just to audibly tell stories, it's a great way to give our kids a prompt to start them young. The next thing, you know, one of the last things in, within the mindset of doing this is is really embracing that short short idea. Like where you're doing these writing prompts, they're very short for our daughter to write. Um, if we ask her to write a short story when she's a little bit older, they're going to be really short stories and they're not going to be long novels. We're not expecting you to do no, that. Nobody's expecting the kid to write And I know we talked like, the whole breadth of, of writing fiction, because we understand that, you know, writing fiction can start at four years old. It can start at 14. Um, and the, the, what they produce at those different levels is dramatically different. And so it's hard to say, okay, for this age, you do this. And for this age, you do this, because you can have a very accomplished young writer at like, who's 12. Well, who's we're, writing really sophisticated that, Christopher stories. Christopher Paolini Christopher guy, Paolini, right? right? Wrote Aragon at like 17. Yeah, or something. He was a teenager when he wrote that. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. So the, lots of good things, but you're right, starting small. Um, we talked about doing some fan fiction, um, but you can also do what we call what we call flash fiction. Explain yes. explain what flash fiction is for folks that don't know. So uh, I'll give you the broad thing. Um, you have different lengths of, of work. And they have different names. So you could have epic fantasy, which could be like a George R. R. Martin Wheel of Time type yeah, of book. Yeah, 1,200 pages. Yeah, 1,200 pages. You're talking like a half a million words. That's enormous, right? A nor- you could have a long novel, which would be like 120, 130, 140,000 words. And that we're talking that's like five, 600 pages. A novel that you pick up off like the rack at the store. Yeah, 350 maybe. Maybe 350 pages. That's more of like 87, 85,000 words type of range. You can have a short novel. Um, that could be a 50, 60,000 words. That might be 250 pages. Like 
we're talking like um, uh, Fahrenheit 451 yep. type of thing. And things. then you're going to go down to the novella. Novella, which is like a, of mice and men, maybe sub 150 pages mm-hmm. we're looking Stephen at. Stephen King, Cycle of the Werewolf. Cycle of the Werewolf, things of that nature. Stephen King's are, actually, Stephen King's a really good example of a master of the all of the various forms. So he's a master at long fiction, you know, like It or, you know, one of his one of his um you know like the dark tower series the stand the stand is a great example of kind of an epic fantasy he's also a master at the short story as well and he's many would say he's arguably better at the short story than he is with the longer stories yeah no time to meander yeah no time to meander the short novellas you know sub 150 pages you're looking at 30,000 20,000 words then you have a novelette which is even smaller then you kind of have a the novelette and the short story kind of bridge um novelette can be a little bit longer than a short story can be shorter they kind of bridge there Short story can go all the way down to like, I've seen some people define it down to 150, uh, 1500 words or a thousand words. And you're looking at like, if you're thinking about it, 250 to 280 words per page is a typical fiction. So you're talking about four or five, six page short story. That's yeah. really short, right? Flash fiction is sub 500 words. So you're talking about a challenge. One, cool. one page to two pages of writing and you have to tell an inc- a complete arc and in some respects flash fiction can be very difficult and most people turn their flash fiction into just a scene right because mm-hmm. oh it's i gotta just tell this short thing but it really challenges you to write something very short it's cool yeah it is it's, it's a tough one so um writing shorter stuff is really I, and i think from the standpoint of children they will use less words and tell a bigger story mm-hmm. when you're a more accomplished writer you want to you want to fill out a lot more so it's a harder to prune the words actually being an older writer and writing flash fiction, I think is more difficult than a younger writer writing flash fiction, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and finally, I think analyzing good media, whether it's movies, I, I really, I know I always draw allusions to writing and using movies and television as a proxy for that, but that's it's, writing though. It's, it's just writing that's been made into a visual, a, a visual form. form. Exactly. But the thing about movies and TV that I really like with respect to storytelling and writing is that they are consumable on a shorter time span. So you can watch a movie, for example, like Avatar, right? That if it were turned into a movie that was in a novel form, it'd be 300 pages long. and It would take you seven, eight hours to read. That was right? another one we did around the campfire, Avatar. Exactly. That and, was, was a big hit. But you can watch that movie three times in the same time it would take you to read it three times. But I think you would get more out of the movie visually. So you can see more story and you can see more nuance and you experience more. And a lot of times what's very funny that a lot of writers will tell you is that when you are doing your writing... You're literally writing the movie in your head. And mm-hmm. so a lot of times writers will abstract that to a movie because they actually see it playing in their head. Very often when they're writing, you're just writing what you're seeing. It's kind of trippy when you actually get into a flow state when you're writing. You're actually just watching the movie and you're like, he did this. Then he did this. Oh my God, they did that. It's like, mm-hmm. and they're saying things. Oh my gosh, I can't believe he said that. You know, like you get actually caught up in, in, in the movie that's playing inside your head. So that's why there's a lot of illusions when you hear writers talking about things. They love film and they love TV because that's what they experience when they're writing their story. And so consuming that type of media, asking questions and talking about you know character motivations and talking about plot with, with respect to movies, I think is really, really important. And watching people talk about those things is also very important. Watch reading Um, movie reviews, watching critiques, actually reading and and hearing people talk about why this movie is great. There's a whole genre of YouTube, which is centered on this idea of audio visual essays talking about film. And I'll put a few into the, uh, into the show notes where people talk about an, uh, an off, you know, a movie auteur who has a whole, you know, suite of movies like a Christopher Nolan or a Wes Anderson and they talk about the themes that run through all of their movies and they're showing you snippets and clips of it and yeah it's like an audio essay but with a visual element mm-hmm. to it super super compelling but it's really great for as a writer to hear this more elevated discussion about yeah. the craft to think about okay how do I apply that to my writing what am I be, learning here that would be great for high school yeah. students to oh, really yeah. think about the themes when you're watching something that you know the yeah. good versus evil the yeah. motivations of the characters absolutely and, like understanding like oh I watched a an hour long essay about Kurosawa and all his movies and and oh, I'd be so asleep <laughs> and understanding like 
you know, how does he use color here? And how did he use black and white here to tell his story? And understanding like those are decisions that are mm -hmm. made on the micro scale. And, you know, all that attention to detail is the same attention to detail that authors need to put into their work. And, and it gives you a frame of mind to think. So I it was a big, long episode. Yeah, I think this is great, though, because but this yeah. is, you know, a lot of times we're focusing on early learners, but this is something that's going to start young with the with the imaginary yeah. games and audio storytelling. And then it's going to go into, you know, short stories and fun things as they're elementary. And some of this stuff we're talking about goes all the way into high school mm -hmm. where kids are really going to want to know about you know, how do you structure things? What are major themes? If especially if they want to perhaps pursue a career as writers or have, have a, a, a hobby, hobby yeah. a lifetime hobby. There's a, there's so many people that we know that are yeah. actually authors as their main hobby. So I think it's a great it's a great thing to do. It's really important great outlet. I've seen young people come into my writing groups who are writing their first novel. Um, I waited until I had my first kid to write my first novel. And one of my good writing friends, she was, I think, 68 when she finally wrote her first novel. And so just because we're talking about young children, this is not something that will end at 18. Right. This is a lifelong hobby that they could Maybe carry. if you're a mom or dad listening out there that you've always kind of secretly exactly. wanted to be a writer. We actually have a good friend who's in the middle of her master's for mm -hmm. writing right now that, that we had no idea that she wanted to be a writer. We have another friend who's a um, homeschool mom who's... You know, finishing up at the third book in her trilogy, which she's about to publish as well. Almost so, yeah. everyone we know actually is writing in one way or another. Even another friend of mine has started writing some short form um, fictional... Um, memoir fiction. Memoir type non -fiction, stuff. Yeah. Um, yep. And we've got a couple different friends writing novels. And it's just folks you wouldn't you wouldn't think of. That's not their their day job or anything, but they love to write. We have another friend who's a very accomplished... Um, a uh, fan fiction writer who has a, a, a who has got a decent little following about her writing of anime fan fiction. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really cool. So if it's something yeah. that you've ever wanted to do, these are all great links. Or if you've got a high schooler who really wants to start getting into this, all these links will be really helpful. So we hope that this has been a, I think it's been a great contribution yeah. to our writing month. And so. we're elevating a little bit past the early learners. So we hope this was all interesting for everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. Please engage with us on social media. Join our Homeschool Together podcast group on Facebook and find us at Homeschool Together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!